thank you, thank you so much. Uh, this, is, this is the start of a wonderful program. And I want to thank each and every one of you for being here tonight. Uh, this is, by the way, this is the first time we've been out to the Huntington Club here. Uh, it's, it's an experiment. Uh, thumbs up. What does everybody think? Yeah. Okay. Very good. Very good. Very good. Uh, well, I, I thank you. Thank you. This is, what we're trying to do is, it's an Indian, Indian food meal with a, a U.S. India relations event. So uh, we're uh, so thank you all again for for being here, especially during this experiment. But uh, we I want to thank in particular the members of our Founders Club. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's, a, it's actually a relatively new thing. And the Founders, it's not an exclusive club. It's our it's a club of our major donors. And uh, thank you to those who are here, Bill, Helen, uh, and and by the way. Those of you who'd like to join this club, we, we do a lot of special things to show our appreciation for our major donors, but we, uh, we would love to have you join us. So please, uh, please see me or, uh, and uh, I'll tell you, we'll tell you more about it. Uh, but also, I uh, wanted to tell you a couple of interesting things. Tonight, we, uh, uh, we, we just found out today, uh, we are, we will have a gala in December with uh, Lieutenant General retired H.R. McMaster, the former uh, National Security Advisor. And we just found today, so it's a save the date. Event. So if you'll remember to keep your calendars open for the 16th of December, that should be a really great event, but it'll be a gala. We'll be, uh, we'll be moving forward. So that's an exciting uh, event we have uh, uh, tonight. Uh, so what, uh, let's go ahead and get started with the, with the event and, uh, let, and to introduce our speakers tonight. We're so delighted to have the program we are. I'm going to let Ronick decide, uh, introduce our, our speakers to you. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit about Ronick. Ronick is one of our members who is who handles the India practice at the Paul Hastings Law Firm, uh, not only here in Costa Mesa, but also Washington, D.C. Ronick also advises members of Congress, policymakers on India matters. And he is a, a, a writer. He contributes routinely uh, to periodicals like the uh, uh, Bloomberg, Forbes, and most recently, Washington Post. So it's a real pleasure for us uh, to have Ronick here tonight. And would you please join me in welcoming Ronick Desai, uh, who will introduce our guest. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Richard, thank you for that very gracious uh, introduction that my office wrote for you. And uh, it, is my, it is my high privilege to introduce both our speakers uh, for tonight's event, uh, Gunjan Bagla and Ambassador Ken Jester. Uh, I'll start with Gunjan here. Gunjan is a very prominent Indian American uh, community leader, businessman, author, and thought leader. Uh, he's a graduate of the eminent IIT universities back in India, and he's the founder and current managing director of Umrit Ventures, which is based in Malibu, California. Uh, the company has established a very impressive and long track record of, of advising companies, both US and EU, that uh, are operating in some of the fastest growing economies in the world, including India and China. Gunjan is the author of a book, uh, Conducting Business in 21st Century India. Uh, critically acclaimed, it was called uh, an effective and practical uh, treatment of a very, very complex subject. And he's also a frequent uh, contributor and commentator to a host of different publications, including the Harvard Business Review, the New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal. So we are absolutely delighted that Gunjan will be leading our guest of honor today in conversation this evening. Which brings us, of course, to Ambassador Ken Jester. So in September of 2017, the President of the United States nominated Ambassador Jester to serve uh, as his personal representative and ambassador to the Republic of India. Uh, a few short weeks later, the United States Senate confirmed Ambassador Jester to that post unanimously. And uh, I say that because the word Senate and unanimous are ones that I never thought I'd say in the same sentence. Uh, but he was confirmed unanimously, which is a real testament, I think, to his unique credentials and qualifications for that post. 
at that time. And Richard mentioned in his introduction that I, I do some writing. I've covered the nomination for Forbes and a couple other publications. And what I had said back then was that you know the, the president had really hit a home run by nominating uh, Ambassador Jester to the post. It was a very welcome appointment. And not just because you know, he has served at the highest echelons of the United States government for uh, several years, State Department, White House, Commerce Department, but he was one of the rare individuals that actually knew a lot about India. Uh, and had been a real champion custodian of the relationship even before becoming ambassador to India in 2017. When he was at the Commerce Department, for example, in a very senior role, uh, he had played a, a central, uh, central role in essentially shepherding through what would become the U.S.-India civilian nuclear deal. He laid the groundwork for this deal that obviously was transformational uh, for the U.S.-India relationship. And when I wrote this piece, I remember I reached out to a bunch of former U.S. ambassadors to India as to see if they would comment on the nomination, and uh, they all couldn't wait to do it. And, and again, Democrats, Republicans alike, lavished praise on Ambassador Duster, and that praise turned out to be very prescient. Uh, once he reached New Delhi uh, later that year, he presided over some of the most consequential uh, developments and undertakings of the U.S. India relationship. He presided over the most significant growth period of the relationship in a very long time. The strategic partnership, as we call it, witnessed and experienced growth in virtually every arena. Security, defense, trade, commercial, science and technology because of Ambassador Jester's uh, leadership. At the same time, uh, his tenure also coincided with a very historic visit by Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi to Houston. Uh, those of you may be familiar with the uh, Howdy Modi event. Uh, Ambassador Jester and I found ourselves backstage together. And just a few short months after that, President Tripp made a historic visit to the United States in February of 2020, I think right before the COVID pandemic erupted. Um, the relationship is stronger and, and, and much more consequential because of the unique uh, work and leadership that, that Ambassador Jester brought to it. He's now back in private practice uh, in New York at one of the magic circle firms at Fresh Fields. And uh, he very graciously hosted me in New Delhi at Roosevelt House almost five years ago. Uh, and it is my, again, high privilege to not just return the favor, but to welcome both him and his wife, Alyssa, back here to Orange County this evening. So if I can both invite you to come up and take the stage, and if you can please join me in giving them a round of applause. Indian origin. How many of you have been in India more than once? Just a few. Okay. So uh, this quick overview might be helpful to you. Look at the graph on the left there. Uh, India entered the top 10 economies of the world in 2012. Okay. The top four have stayed the same. But India is the one economy that has risen rapidly. And it, last year was significant because it crossed the GDP of France. And to the celebration of most Indians, it crossed the GDP of its former ruler, the United Kingdom. There are other points listed there. I won't go into all of that. You can read them uh, right there. Uh, Southern California, Ambassador Justin, is very important to the US-India relationship and to the development of Indian Americans. Uh, I'm sure you know that the first Indian congressman elected to the House of Representatives was the Singh Song from here in the uh, Valley. Uh, just a few years before he was elected was when Indians first got the right to, to earn the US citizenship. There used to be a law on the, on, on the books called the Hindu Exclusion Act. You know, which for 50 years prevented Indians from becoming U.S. citizens. So the Indian American community has come a long way. Today, the CEOs of Google, Microsoft, uh, uh, the World Bank now soon, and for my wife, the most important one, Starbucks, <laughs> is, is, is an Indian American. Okay. So the Indian American community has come a long way. The U.S.-India relationship has come a long way. So uh, 
Ambassador just started in India through the Commerce Department, if I'm right. And so I just wanted to show a couple of slides about commerce. You see that on the top left is a slide from the Center of Strategic and International Studies. Uh, the, uh, they have an India chair, and he puts out a lot of good information. So India's trade with the US bilateral trade went up 17% last year. And India is now among the top 10 trading partners with the US consistently. You see a picture at the bottom left, okay? That is uh, a representative of a very large order that Air India placed on the Boeing company. It was large enough for the President of the United States to put out a statement saying that this order of $34 billion will support a million American jobs. Now, here in Southern California, Ambassador, if you just go up a few miles on the 405, you'll come across the former Boeing factory where the C-17 aircraft were manufactured. How many of you know about the C-17? The C-17 is one of the largest transport aircraft. The Indian Air Force now is the largest operator of C-17 any, anywhere in the world other than the United States Air Force. Okay. And some of you may have seen pictures of India delivering supplies to Turkey, or Turkey, I should say. The aircraft that took those materials were American-made, long manufactured C-17. Okay. Uh, on the top right, you see a picture, an ad of the almonds. Do you know that India is the largest consumer of California almonds in the world? One billion dollars of almonds were exported from the from the orchards of San Joaquin Valley, you know, to 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 India. Uh, I have one or two more slides. So here, I just want to emphasize what has happened in the last few months. Last month, actually. So the Commerce Secretary was in India, Gina Raimondo. The Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, was in India. You can barely see him there. I just wanted to show the picture of Air Force Two. You know, when the President is not flying in that plane, it's called Air Force Two. And uh, that's Air Force Two landing in, in New Delhi. Bottom left, you see Janet Yellen, the Secretary of the Treasury. Okay. And the next picture, you see someone that might look familiar on the left. Okay. But let's blow it up on the following slide. Okay. Uh, so that is uh, Ambassador Juster on the left, most recently in India, just what, two weeks ago? At the Raisina Dialogues, which is a dialogue held every year for the last 13 years. So how many of you here are fans of the Rolling Stones? <laughs> you know, Ambassador Juster showed his talent very, very early in his career. I think it was in, in middle school when he interviewed Mick Jagger and Keith Richard. So uh, it's been an amazing journey, and thank you so much, Ambassador. You've done your homework. Oh, yeah, I've done my homework. I listened to the entire Heritage Foundation podcast that you did recently as well. Um, and it's great to see someone who has balance looking at the U.S.-India relations. Because I think sometimes if you read the media, whether it's Indian media or American media, you know, there are people on the extreme. And the relationship has grown consistently because there is mutual well-being, mutual interest, and leadership from people like Ken Justo, who have taken the relationship forward despite the many differences that arise between friends. Now, friends have disagreements, right? Canada is, a, is a, our neighbor, but they renamed the Northwest Passage to the Canadian Inter Inland Waterway because they wanted to take claim over it, and the U.S. Navy has sent ships through there to assert that it's international territory. So let me start with asking you, sir, uh, for those of, who, those of us here who may not be familiar with India so much, why should the America care about India at all? What's, what drives us together? What matters? So first of all, let me say what a great pleasure it is to be here in Orange County and to be at this dinner this evening. I thank all of you for your tremendous hospitality. Uh, Jeff Hubbard, especially for working out all the arrangements. I thank you for that very warm and generous introduction. I wish my 
95-year-old mother who can hear to hear her. <laughs> but I have my wife here, Elisa, so I'm delighted that she hurts. Uh, and thank you, Gunjan, for all of your introductory comments uh, as well. Why should the United States be interested in India? Well, strangely, for many years, we didn't have a very close relationship with India. While we recognized uh, India before it became independent in 1946, the relationship during the Cold War was rather cool and distant, in part because the United States had a close relationship with Pakistan, India's major rivalry. And India was the leader of the non-aligned movement and eventually ended up purchasing a lot of its military equipment from the Soviet Union. This began to change after the end of the Cold War, and in India, which had been a largely closed socialist economy, uh, started to liberalize. But it was really only at the end of the Clinton administration, when President Clinton made an historic trip to India in 2000, and then the administration of George W. Bush, that we started to transform the relationship. And why was that? The well, first, President Bush had the very simple idea that the world's oldest democracy, the United States, and its largest democracy, you should have a better relationship. Uh, and India was, at that point, in time, the second most populous country in the world. It's either is now or will soon be the most populous country. Its economy was starting to grow at a good rate. Uh, it is a democracy. It's a nuclear country. It's inevitably going to be a leading power. And we should have a good relationship with India for all of those reasons. In addition, more recently, uh, with the rise of China, India-U.S. relationship is really seen as a counterbalance to uh, China's efforts to, in many respects, reshape the Indo-Pacific region. So the relationship has grown and really been transformed over the last 20 plus years. And another huge ingredient, uh, and some of it's present in this room, has been the Indian American population in the United States, which has grown exponentially in the last 20 plus years. For the point where you have over 4 million Indian Americans here, and you have close to a million Americans living in India, many of whom are the children of Indian couples when they were living in the United States. So it's a relationship that makes sense on many levels. One, in terms of the overall size and magnitude of India and its inevitable role in the world. Uh, two, as uh, democracies that share many interests in common. Three, on the people-to-people -people level. And I think it's going to be, and has been said to be, one of the most consequential relationships uh, going forward in the century. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. So when my Indian friends talk about the relationship India has with Russia, and ask about it. I say, how many, how many of you have relatives? How many of you have relatives living in, in Russia? Okay, and the numbers are fairly small, right? The how many, how many of you send their, your children to study in Russia? The numbers are fairly small, right? So the people-to-people -people relationships matter a lot. Our, India's foreign minister has two children. One is Dhruva Jashankar, who lives in Washington, D.C., and his daughter lives right here in Southern California. Yeah, has three children. The third one lives in New York. Ah, okay. Also, uh, you know, just to pick up on this point, uh, as ambassador, you travel around the country because it's important to understand India. It's a very complicated and diverse place. And I remember one governor told me that her most important investments were in the United States. And I was quickly trying to talk in my mind, is it Google stock, is it Apple, is it Amazon? And she said, no, they're children. <laughs> and a number of Indian government officials, business executives, who have children in the United States is astonishing, but it really is evidence of the uh, importance of the relationship. Thank you, thank you. So you were in India as ambassador for about three and a half, four years. Um, how did the U.S.-India relationship change in your opinion? Well, as I said, it really has grown in leaps and bounds over the last 20 years. Uh, it began focusing somewhat on the trade and technology relationship, a bit on the defense relationship, but it now encompasses every subject of human endeavor. And we worked to expand that uh, during the time. 
the defense and counterterrorism relationship continue to grow. We signed what are known as foundational agreements uh, between our two defense sectors that have greatly enabled us to share <coughs> sensitive and classified information with India, to uh, provide for logistics coordination, a geospatial intelligence, and this played a key role when uh, China moved on India more than 2020. As I said on the clip, the trade relationship has continued to expand and grow, uh, even if it does not, in my opinion, fulfill its potential. The energy relationship has blossomed. Uh, when I began, we were just beginning the first shipments of oil and liquefied natural gas to India, now we're a significant supplier of that, along with coal and along with renewables. So we were with India across the board on energy issues. We've had a long health care relationship, but it rose to a new level during the COVID. Crisis. Oh, well, I could go on and on. Science and technology, space, we work together. Uh, education, we have now 240,000 Indian students studying in the United States. Uh, so it really covers, as I say, every issue and has grown uh, substantially. But one other point I'd mention is that we're now working uh, more closely together in multilateral fora. And the most significant thing I think we did was to revive something known as the Quad, and I hope we'll get into that, which is a grouping of the United States, India, Japan, and Australia. Uh, and what's unique about it is it's three treaty allies, the United States, Japan, and Australia, and one what we call strategic partner, India. And I can get more into that as our conversation continues. Yeah, thank you, and that, that will lead me to my next question. But before I get there, so I also want to acknowledge one other very really important U.S.-India relationship that's centered right here in Southern California, and that is the NISAR project. That's a billion-dollar satellite project where JPL in Pasadena is working together with ISRO in India, and this satellite, when launched next year, will have the ability to measure the Earth like nothing has ever done before, down to centimeters. So as the Atlantic, as the Arctic ice cap melts, they'll be able to track the movement exactly as fires or earthquakes affect the landscape of the United States, they'll be able to measure that exactly. There will be two instruments on the satellite. One is American, one is Indian. The satellite will be launched from Sea Harikota in India. Okay? It's an equal collaboration. This is not outsourcing to India. This is an equal partnership between the two countries happening right here, about 30 miles from where we are sitting. Okay? So let's talk about the Quad a little bit further. Now the Quad uh, is the you know, I don't want to call it an alliance, uh, a dialogue, I guess, between, you know, four democracies that uh, affect the Indo-Pacific. The Quad began really as a thought right after the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004. And those of you of Indian origin might know that more people died in India from that tsunami than in Indonesia. Okay, over 100,000 Indians died at that time. And President Bush brought the, the four countries together to be able to deal with issues. And then it went dormant for a while until President Trump revived it. And now President Biden has taken it much further. So next, oh, we are still in March. In May, uh, the Quad will meet in Australia. And so I want to know what you think will be the next goals and accomplishments of the Quad. Well, let me give a little more context to the Quad itself. As you said, this grouping of four countries began for humanitarian assistance and disaster relief after the 2004 tsunami. It then formally came together in 2007 under the title of Quadrilateral Security Dialogue. And the real leader in this process was former Prime Minister Abe of Japan, who in a uh, seminal speech in India in 2007 spoke of the confluence of the two seas and really created the concept of the Indo-Pacific. And in doing so, he brought India skillfully into the broader geopolitical strategy of this region and laid the groundwork for the quadrilateral grouping of these four countries. But China immediately protested Critics called it an Asian NATO, and in 2008 it was disbanded. And it stayed that way for nine years until 2017 when the United States and Japan thought that we should try to resurrect the Quad. 
Uh, India, because it lives in a different geographical location in the United States with China on its border, has been a little cautious in proceeding forward and did not want it viewed as either a anti-China or security-oriented grouping. Uh, and so we began at the working level, and the Quad has been designed to promote a positive agenda for issues of common good in the region, and it's what these countries are for as opposed to what they're against. It worked on vaccine distribution, on cybersecurity, on now critical emerging technologies, on supply chain resilience, uh, and a host of other related issues, including maritime domain uh, awareness. Uh, and we had working level meetings in 2017 and 18, and then were able to elevate it to the ministerial level, the foreign ministers. And we had that first meeting in 2019, and then we had another one in October of 2020 in person despite COVID. And as been stated, uh, when President Biden came into office, he was able to elevate the Quad to the uh, summit level of leadership. And they've had several meetings at the leadership level, and they have one coming up in May. Now, you may ask, why has that progression taken place? And what's different now than was the case in 2008 when it expanded? And there are several reasons. First, India's bilateral relationship with each of the three countries, Japan, the United States, and Australia, has really been transformed in the last uh, 14 years and become much closer uh, I can speak primarily about the U.S. India relationship, but uh, similar things have occurred in U.S.-Japan. And only more recently, I mean, in India-Japan, in terms of its relationship with Australia, India felt that Australia was a little too close to China, but the Chinese, uh, after COVID uh, uh, came about and the Australians pushed to uh, study what the origins of COVID might be, the Chinese took a variety of economic activities against Australia, and Australia, like the others, now share strategic clarity on some of the challenges in the Indo-Pacific, including with the rise of China. And this has accelerated the development of uh, the Quad and India's willingness to move forward uh, on a range of initiatives, still, though, without making it a security relationship. And in fact, you'll now see that it's not referred to as the Quadrilateral Security Dollar, which is the Quad. Uh, so the security is not in there. So what might we see? Well, although security is not an explicit area of focus, there is increasingly focus on maritime issues. And when the ministers met, and there was in India uh, earlier this month, and it was in conjunction with the Russian dialogue, they formed a maritime security. And so I think we'll see more developments in that. I think we're going to see more of a focus on how to develop resilient supply chains, which is sort of a code word for supply chains that don't include China uh, in them. Uh, there's going to be a greater development on how uh, the countries can coordinate on critical and emerging technologies uh, and other initiatives of the like as they keep building from the ground up uh, really a unique uh, grouping. It is not an alliance with three alliance partners and one strategic partner and see where that goes, even though they all have slightly different views as to uh, some of the tectonic shifts that are occurring in the Indo-Pacific region, which are quite significant. Thank you. Thank you. And I should note that uh, this year, the Prime Minister of Japan, which is a member of the court, has visited India twice. The Prime Minister of Australia was also in India for Holi, just like the Secretary of Commerce. And for those of you who are curious, I can share some Holi videos for both uh, Gina Raimondo and Tony Albanese. Um, let me ask the Indian Americans in the audience a question. Okay. And you kind of alluded to it, so. Uh, is, is India an ally to the United States? How many of you believe yes? If you do. Okay, so let's clarify that term. Okay. Uh, technically, India is not a U.S. ally. So if you can explain so what strategic partnership means and well, how it is different from ally, that would be very helpful. Well, as I mentioned earlier, India, in part because of its history of being uh, dominated by a colonial power, uh, 
led the non-alignment after it gained independence, and it has an aversion to any sort of alliance in which it is potentially subordinate to another partner. And so it no longer refers to the non-aligned movement, but India has a doctrine of strategic autonomy, which means that it will have an independent foreign policy. Uh, and it has strategic partnerships with three countries, uh, 29, 30, 31, including Russia, including China, including Iran, countries that are not necessarily partners with the United States, but this is part of India's overall perspective on how to manage its own foreign policy. And you see now increasingly the use of this term strategic partnership. The United States has many strategic partners, which are not countries that have treaty obligations, whether it's under NATO or under bilateral agreements, but see eye to eye in certain issues and share common interests and work together on those, but without any form of exact obligation uh, to pursue them. And India and the United States are strategic partners. Uh, but the war in Russia is an example of where we actually view things uh, differently. And we both have to learn how to uh, work through our disagreements about we pursue our common interests. Richard, do we want to start with the audience questions? Well, and in fact, uh, you know, please continue. I, I, I apologize for doing this earlier. Uh, this is a dialogue with all of you as well, and I should have mentioned this, but on your table, if you'll notice in the middle of your table, there's these white sheets and, and pens. So if you have a question, please write the question out and, you know, just raise it up and we'll have somebody come by, as, as John here is, is doing right now, is, is modeling now. Thank you, John, here for modeling. But um, if you have a question, our, our, our staff will pick it up, but please, I apologize for the interruption. No, in India, we are used to interruptions all the time. <laughs> Be fine. We are demonstrating to you how work with India will go. Just a quick question. What about New Zealand? And what, when you say what about New Zealand? It's not part of the Quad. No, New Zealand's not part of the Quad, but New Zealand is a country that the United States certainly has a close play. Should we have something called Five Eyes, which is an intelligence sharing agreement with Canada, United Kingdom, New Zealand, and Australia? And the Quad itself is four countries, but they work with other countries outside the Quad. And they work together with New Zealand on certain issues uh, as well. But it is not a core member of this uh, quadrilateral movement. Thank you. So uh, I want to drill down a little bit on misunderstandings between the two countries. So some time ago, I was approached by a US defense-oriented company. And they had received an inquiry from the Indian Army uh, to, to bid on some aircraft. And they came to me, they were ready to fly to India. And they said, look, we have an incredible offer, but the person who sent us the RFI hasn't been responding to us. Uh, you know, we will not only provide these aircraft, we will provide the American pilots to man those aircraft. And I said, hold on, don't get your visas yet. Don't get on an airplane yet. First of all, your inquiry is from a mid-level army official. He doesn't even have the right to meet you, okay? To meet a foreign citizen. I, when I travel to India, I have to get permission to meet anybody in the Ministry of Defense, okay? Uh, and these guys were certainly not going to get a meeting with this individual. Secondly, there's no way that India is going to accept American pilots flying its defense aircraft anytime soon. So, uh, as I said, any country wants to accept that. Yeah, yeah. So, hold your horses, keep, save your money, stick, stick around in the US. This is not a deal that you want to pursue. I want you to give that example, sir, because there are many misunderstandings between the two countries. And one misunderstanding I hear about in India all the time is that one particular political party is much more friendly to India than the other. Uh, I won't name them. I think most of you know what we are referring to. Uh, you want to address that? Yeah. Uh, one of the, you know, there's a lot of polarization in Washington, D.C. these days, if you haven't noticed. But one of the few issues on which there is a true bipartisan consensus is the importance of the U.S.-India relationship. And it has been pursued both in India and the United States across political parties in a way that each has built on the uh, successes of its predecessor. 
and the United States, but it has been the anti-Clinton administration, the George W. Bush administration, the Obama administration, the Trump administration, and now the Biden administration. There have been some differences. Uh, I think there was a sense uh, that the Republicans were more focused on free trade and the Democrats were a little less committed to that. But unfortunately, in my opinion, the Republicans are now equally backing off from uh, free trade and uh, neither party seems anxious to pursue a free trade agreement, which I also think is a strategic mistake because China uh, has a very robust economic a strategy for the region. Uh, on a bilateral basis, it's the leader in trade with most every country in Asia, but it's also joined the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, which puts together 15 countries in the region. India had been involved in negotiations with Peru uh, before it was signed. And it's applied to join the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement on trans pacific Partnership, something the United States has pioneered and signed, but before it was ratified, we abruptly withdrew from it. And so I think both India and the United States need to have a better bilateral and uh, regional uh, trade strategy. Uh, but in terms of other, uh, your questions, other areas of, uh, of well, misunderstanding. misunderstanding. So let me flip that yeah. to, when you, were when you were explaining India to your American colleagues, right. where were the areas of misunderstanding within state or defense or commerce or in the White House? Well, I think, again, they're, the people in the administration are pretty sophisticated, but when you get outside, there is a sense, and we've seen it in the war uh, in Ukraine, that India is an ally and India should be work, uh, working in lockstep with us on all of our uh, initiatives, and that's just not the case uh, for the reasons that I've explained them go into in greater detail. Uh, and uh, there are interests that we share and work together. But getting back to the question on Democrats and Republicans, uh, another area that at times uh, there's been a sense there might be uh, a little disagreement on may be on energy, where the United States and on the Republicans, as I mentioned, are willing to supply coal, oil, liquefied natural gas as well as renewables, and the Democrats maybe have more of an emphasis on the renewable area uh, overall. And on human rights, where uh, these issues arise in India, but I think Republican administrations have tended to want to discuss them privately, uh, and sometimes the Democratic uh, legislators especially uh, speak about these issues in a public way that in my view, is sort of counterproductive to address the issue. But these are minor differences, uh, and in a broad way, the relationship enjoys the support of both parties. Uh, we have built on each other's success. There's a group of us that have worked together on these issues for 20 plus years. I've spoken on several occasions with my successor, who will be getting out to India shortly. Uh, and it truly is one of the areas of trade bipartisan agreement. President Huston, you anticipated my next question about six times during this conversation. So you were, elected, you were approved unanimously by the Senate. Your successor had a two-year battle uh, and it was finally approved 52 to 42. I don't know how many deals President Biden had to make to get that through, uh, but certainly it was challenging. So uh, my friend Thomas Malayel had this question, which I was going to ask you. And what would be your advice to Eric Garcetti as he embarks you know, on this trip and the journey? Well, you know, first of all, I, yeah, it's not for me to say what the reasons were for the delay, but I know from speaking with the Mayor Garcetti that he's well qualified and he's uh, eager to get out to India. He uh, knows and studied uh, India in the past. I think it would make a great ambassador. Uh, my advice would be that first, there is a tremendous number of issues in the relationship, and there's never any shortage of good ideas right now. There's a lot of focus on an initiative related to critical and emerging technologies and how we can work together. But you've got to have some priorities, because if we try to do everything, the Indian bureaucracy is not broad enough, and even in America, we get. Uh, losing our attention span. So on a policy level, decide what you think is really doable. And uh, India 
U.S. relationships, when you step back and look at the progress over the last 22 years, it's enormous. But day to day basis, it can be difficult at times. It's nothing because we are partners and not allies. Every issue is open for debate and discussion and negotiation. And so you really have to decide what can we get done and how do we make that a priority. But being ambassador is more than just dealing with policy issues. Uh, you also have to manage, it's a big management job, the U.S. mission to India, which is the embassy of our four consulates in uh, Mumbai, Chennai, uh, Hyderabad, uh, and Calcutta, have 2,500 people. It's the third largest mission in the world. And you have 2,500 people and their families. And you're responsible for that. You're also responsible for every American in India and everyone who comes through. And so uh, you need to spend some time really making sure that the morale of your people at the embassy is good. I, I think after having a two-year gap with no ambassador, that's not an insubstantial task to make sure that the embassy rallies together. Because if we're not working as one, we're never going to be as good as we uh, can be. Uh, I think a third uh, piece of advice is something that the now Foreign Minister Jay Shankar told me when I got to India was get outside of Delhi. I mean, the real benefit of an ambassador, especially in a country as complicated as India, is to be able to provide advice back to Washington that's nuanced, that's insightful, that gives them more than they are reading the paper, that goes beneath the policy statements that are made by the government of India. And you've really got to get out into the country to understand its diversity and complexity, to see what the business leaders are saying, what the uh, state leaders are saying, uh, what people in civil society are saying, and to really get a feel for it. And it also is important in doing your job. But one of the, you know, we had a variety of different crises and challenges while I was ambassador. One of them was dealing with COVID-19 and repatriating close to 6,000 Americans. They were uh, spread all over India, and India had a complete lockdown for six weeks, no one could move uh, without special licenses and permissions. But knowing the state uh, governments enabled me to call up uh, ministers, secretaries, chief minister and secretary, and actually help get people across state lines, uh, which is not something that the central government controls. So I would say focus on your policy priorities, make sure the embassy morale is in good shape and people understand what their roles are and get outside of Delhi and really understand the country so you can both provide to Indians a nuanced understanding of America and provide that to people in Washington a better understanding of India. Thank you, thank you. And we are recording this so we can send that to American City. Okay. <laughs> um, so there are enough questions here to keep us here till midnight. <laughs> We are going to San Diego tomorrow, so we stay till midnight, is it all right? <laughs> I think uh, midnight on the East Coast. All right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Ambassador just, uh, just came in today, so he's on Eastern time. Um, I think we will need to switch to a lightning round of all kinds of things to go through as many questions as possible. And uh, would someone get us a couple of uh, cups of water here, if possible? Okay, so uh, there's a question about you know, you mentioned the four consulates, American consulates in India. Uh, here in Los Angeles, every time an Indian ambassador shows up, I welcome them by saying, Come, welcome to the largest city in the world without an Indian consulate. And I am told that both governments must approve a new consulate. So what would be your advice to us here in Southern California to approach Washington, D.C., and get an, get an okay on the local consulate? Well, there are a lot of issues that go into selecting the consulate. Uh, first of all, it's a costly undertaking, and uh, there are only limited resources in the State Department, so you have to make sure that it actually can pay for itself in terms of the number of visas that go through the system. Uh, and my understanding is that there was actually talk or approval of putting a Indian consulate in Seattle yes. in the Northwest. Uh, so I think they sort of have first dibs on the next consulate, uh, at least when this proposal was agreed upon several years ago. And in India, the thought was maybe putting one 
in uh, the Punjab uh, area. Right. But there has not still been a, uh, any further movement on that. As I say, uh, it's a issue of cost and uh, putting up a type of structure that's necessary. And right now, we're struggling just to operate our consulates as they are because we're way behind in terms of the backlog on visas, which is a, which is a problem. I hope that's another challenge you know, that ASTRA will have is to have a lower the wait time for Indians to see if we get visas to come to the United States. Yeah, I think in Chennai, the wait time to get an appointment is 700 days. Yeah. But I see a tweet every week from the American embassy saying that they want to process one million visas this year. And then we process over a million. We process about 1.2 million. Yeah. It is the second or third most visas in the world. Mexico and China have been above it, but I think China's probably dropped uh, significantly. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to skip over some questions that don't relate to U.S. India. I mean, we've been in third countries. We could be here till next morning. So, uh, <laughs> You covered some of these already. Um, You're not going to ask me about the basketball. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, uh, well, we are in the town that has two great basketball teams. So, uh, that, what, if, what if the N NBA held its first ever exhibition yeah. games in Mumbai in October 2019 uh, when the Sacramento Kings and the Indiana Pacers came over, along with a lot of former greats like Larry Bird and, uh, and others? And so I put out a video welcoming there, and I started playing around a little bit. Awesome, awesome. And I think many of you know who is the owner of the Sacramento Kings and why they have a Diwali celebration every year. Uh, we won't dwell on that more right now. Um, Do you want to talk a little bit about the joint military exercises that the US and India did? Yeah, uh, just the short answer. Sure. Uh, yeah, one of the areas that has really seen a tremendous growth in the relationship is in the defense sector. And again, I began working on the relationship in 2001. We had virtually no military sales to India. We did a limited number of exercises. Uh, we didn't have any of these agreements between the defense sectors. And now uh, India does more military exercises in the United States than any other country. Most of them previously had been single service exercises the Air Forces, the Armies, the Navies. Uh, when I was there, we inaugurated the first tri-services exercise among three services on either side. We've also increased multilateral exercise. There is a Malabar exercise that includes the four countries of the Quad. And these exercises are increasingly complex and uh, important, uh, including ones that we now have done uh, in the area of the border with uh, China. Uh, at the same time, we've also uh, put now personnel at each other's military commands, uh, and so that whole defense relationship has been enhanced greatly. Yeah, in fact, last August, uh, my wife and I were on San Diego Naval Base. Since you're going to San Diego, yes, I want to bring that up. Uh, the, U the Indian Navy sent, had sent out five different ships to five continents, and they chose the San Diego Naval Base to make a friendly call. At that, on that ship, I was pleasantly surprised to see the Secretary of the Navy for that. Yeah. When he flew in all the way from Washington, I was equally the head of Boeing International Sales was there. The frigate was also there to pick up a couple of the Apache helicopters that India... Uh, well, well India. Yeah, one of the uh, more interesting roles was uh, meeting all the military people who came through India including not just from the Indo-Pacific Command based in Hawaii, but from Washington and the heads of the various groups, including the Chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff, been out there, the Defense Secretary, several times. Uh, so that relationship is very uh, robust. And in fact, we now even, a very sensitive area was having a naval ship stop in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, which is right at the uh, mouth of the uh, Malacca Strait. We've done that as well. So. It's been a slow conference building process that's worked out quite nicely. Yeah, and for those of you who don't know the Malacca Strait, that's a very narrow strait about 17 miles wide that about 40% of world trade goes through, and the southern tip of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands sits right at the mouth of that strait. 
So I've heard American defense analysts refer to that as India's stationary aircraft carrier at the mouth of that. If there was ever a conflict with one large country that I shall not name, you know, that the Andaman and Nicobar Islands will be crucial to protecting free trade uh, across the Indo Pacific. Uh, so, do you have any last thoughts that you want to share with the audience? I'm getting the signal from Richard. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I would say that uh, this is, as I mentioned at the outset, an extremely important relationship, uh, especially as the whole international system is in flux and, and fragmentation. You see Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the changes that has caused in Europe with uh, countries like Finland and Sweden, like the joint NATO. You see changes going on in the Middle East uh, with uh, Israel now enhancing its relationship with United Emirates and uh, Bahrain and other Arab countries and potentially Saudi Arabia. But at the same time, you see Saudi Arabia and Iran uh, long brokered by China, and now you see the rise of China and the rise of India, the questions about whether the United States will stay as involved in the Indo-Pacific as uh, uh, I would like to see them stay. And the next five years are going to be a very critical period to see how all these issues shake out, but at the core of it, I think, will be the importance of the U.S.-India relationship and the strengthening of that, even as we our strategic partners are not allies and will face some challenges along the way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rona mentioned my book on doing business in India. I just wanted to show you that you could have written the book. Ah. So, uh, but I do want to share it. Okay, thank with you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you all very much. Hang on just a moment. Um, and, and thank you both very much for a fascinating discussion. Uh, really terrific. The, uh, I, I do need to tell everyone here that the, uh, this discussion is off the record, meaning please don't mention any names. I'm assuming your basketball es exploits are, can be on the record. On the record, <laughs> told. yes, good. So basketball exploits, okay. By the way, one of the questions that Gunja did not get to was how many baskets, how many times did it take you before you could make those baskets. So that was. Uh, <laughs> Fair enough. If you, you want to move that was done in September. It was about 100 degrees outside. And so after about 20 minutes, I collapsed. So I, some of those shots were, you know, one or two. Some of those were four or five shots to uh, get them in. But uh, that part the is off the record. About 20 minutes. Okay. <laughs> that part's off the record. Absolutely. That's, <laughs> but thank, thank you for a wonderful discussion. This was absolutely fascinating. But, 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 I'm going to invite Dr. Harry Sahoda and Dr. Asha Sahoda to come up to help us give, uh, our, on behalf of the World Affairs Council, our, uh, our thank you to you, Ambassador Jester, for coming here. And let me just say uh, in advance here, Dr. Sahoda is a cardiologist. He is the inventor of the Sahota perfusion angioplasty uh, balloon, which is used in uh, angioplasty surgeries all around the world. And uh, he's also the inventor of, uh, of about 12, about two dozen patents on medical devices. And uh, one of the things we're particularly proud of is that he is a woman of our board of, of trustees. And, and Dr. Asha Sahoda is also a force in her own right, an, an OBGYN. But uh, please, uh, if you will, join me in, uh, in thanking Ambassador Jester. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. It's a real pleasure. <laughs> and I'd like to come up and recognize the high school students who are here, which if I fall, people are going to back me up and uh, answer the questions themselves. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, let me uh, let me again thank you, Gunjan. What a wonderful job, Ambassador. Just a terrific. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, let me also thank our staff and our interns, uh, Krista and Lindsay. Lindsay's over here. And it's Krista. Uh, also, our interns, uh, Ashika 
Cindy and Cindy, Cindy Castro and Cindy Say. Or, 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 would you guys, would you guys please stand up? Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah. And last, last but not least, uh, just a reminder: uh, we have some terrific events coming up. The 11th of April, as as Bill mentioned earlier, the 11th of April and the 12th of April, Ambassador Emerson, uh, the Vice President of Capital Group, and former Ambassador of Germany, and Ambassador Pierce on the 12th. So thank you again for joining us uh, for a wonderful evening, and uh, enjoy the evening. One last round of applause. Thank you. And thanks to the side.